Next talk will be on the inevitable yet the oblivious climate change in nephrology. For this session, I'd like uh, the following chairpersons on the table. And uh, here we have Dr. Gokul Nath, former professor, head of nephrology, St. John's Medical College, Bangalore, who will be joining us in a virtual session. Hello, sir. Dr. Avula Srinivas, senior consultant in nephrology, Ashwini Hospital, Guntur. And Dr. Vinod, senior consultant nephrologist at Elite Machine Hospital, Trishur, Kerala. At the outset, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Catherine Barklow. Good afternoon, ma'am. And uh, we are looking forward for an, as we interact with the climate and our uh, survival is dependent on the climatic changes. So how does the climate and its factors affect our kidney? Let's go through. Please, ma'am. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we, it's yeah. audible. I'll share my screen. Yeah. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah, ma'am. It's visible. Thank you. So yes, thank you very much to the organizers of this session for inviting me to speak and to all of you for being here to listen. Um, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity and I suppose particularly the fact that this topic has been recognised as an important one for the Indian and the international nephrology community. Um, so um, I would like to start by acknowledging that I am giving this talk um, from my work in Australia, which is on the traditional lands of the Wanderoo people of the Kulin Nation. Um, it's custom in Australia to always pay um, respect to the traditional owners of the land. And I suppose I would particularly like to acknowledge um, the understanding that Aboriginal people here have always had about the interaction between our health and our environment. And I think there really is just so much that we can learn from Indigenous peoples the world over about environmental stewardship. Um, sorry, my slides are not quite working from my end. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge here the context that we're meeting in. So just a few months ago in, in August of this year, as many will know, um, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released um, an, an up-to-date report on the current state of climate change. It's probably suffice to say that in summarising it, its authors termed the report a code red for humanity. Um, but I think to try to highlight a few key points from it, one stark difference in this report compared to previous ones was that instead of expressing human-induced impact on the climate system in a probabilistic sense, it presented this as an established fact. You know, there is now no scientific doubt. We have altered and we continue to alter our climate. And this is displayed on the figure in this slide, which shows the simulated temperature in green along the bottom had humans not had any influence then the temperature rise with us in the picture. And you will see by the large gap on the side of the graph, the clear human induced signal. You can also see from this graph that last year we reached 1.24 degrees above pre-industrial era temperatures. And I think very interestingly, one additional thing this report told us was that we would have reached 1.5 degrees already, were it not for the fact that at the same time as emitting greenhouse gases, we've also been polluting the atmosphere with things like sulfur aerosols which cool the atmosphere down. You know, I suppose this is in some ways good news in terms of warming, but it, it's obviously not good news in terms of human health. And also what it tells us is that as we clean up air pollution, which we need to do to, to protect people, we're likely to see more warming expressed. Um, and what does the report tell us ahead? As this graph shows that really, and as I'm sure we've all been told many times, this really depends on how much we continue to emit. You know, a four to five degree rise is what we expect with ongoing high greenhouse gas emissions globally. Um, you know, if we continue on the emissions trajectory that we're on now, I think many people don't really have a context for what a four to five degree rise in temperature means. So to try to provide this context, the difference between the Earth's recent average temperature and the average temperature in our last ice age is about five degrees. So when we're talking about a five degree, being five degrees warmer, we're talking about an ice age's worth of temperature but in the other direction. You know, we're really talking about a fundamentally different world. 
you know, to try and drive that point home in the last ice age, our sea levels were 120 metres below where they are now. Um, as most will also know, many countries around the world have committed to reducing their emissions under the Paris Agreement. Um, at the time this report was released, the yellow line in this graph was where we were headed if all countries over time fulfilled all the commitments they had made under the Paris Agreement. The blue lines at the bottom of the graph are where we are aiming. So the world has collectively decided that 1.5 to 2 degrees is the limits of temperature rise that will enable really any sort of safe future. Um, a few other key points in this graph, really under all scenarios, we're likely to exceed 1.5 degrees in the early 2030s. Under a high emission scenario, it could be by the end of this decade. Importantly though, what this graph also shows is that there is hope. You know, if we are able to stick to the very low emission scenario, um, we will temporarily exceed 1.5 degrees, um, but we will come back under by the end of the century. And in doing so, the report suggests that we can avoid tipping points. So those nasty feedbacks that will push back, push the temperature up regardless of what we do. So, you know, what, what it says is that we can control climate change if we choose to. Um, um, we have just reached the end of the 26 conferences of the parties, so the international meeting where our future is, is really negotiated and decided upon by our leaders, and where commitments are made about what each country is willing to do to address the climate problem. You know, where has this meeting left us? You, you can see from this graph that the, the red bar or the red arrows in this graph um, that the, the policies that countries have in place and the actions that are planned currently leave us well short of where we need to be by 2030. And really only under the most optimistic scenario do we see ourselves remaining under two degrees of warming by the end of this century. Um, and this relies on all long-term targets being met. And I think this is, is a, a cause for major anxiety, really. Um, you, know, you have to look really no further than Australia, which is obviously where I'm from. You know, my country has made a net zero 2050 commitment, but we don't really have anything much in the way of a plan for how to get there. And I think that's replicated by you know, numerous countries around the world. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel, though, is that there was an agreement that all of our leaders would return next year to, to negotiate again, with the hope being that that ambition will be ratcheted up over time. Um, so, you know, this is where we are from a climate perspective. We really are in an incredibly tight situation and, and the world collectively needs to act with incredible haste and urgency if we want a safe climate future. Um, I suppose I choose to believe that we can and we will collectively do what needs to be done to protect ourselves um, and this in incredible planet we live on. Um, but at the same time, even with transformative action, it's important to recognise that the impacts of climate change are already being felt around the world. Um, and we will see increasing impacts over time, regardless of what we do, because there is a fair bit more warming already locked into the system because of our past emissions. The next important question from this is what does this mean for health? Um, and as many will know, over a decade ago now, a number of very reputable health bodies, including the Lancet UCL Commission and the World Health Organization declared climate change the greatest health threat of, of this century. Um, the, the somewhat complicated figure in this slide shows the complex relationships between greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and our health. But to try and simplify these impacts down, they're often divided into direct and indirect and deferred or diffuse risks. You know, the most obvious are the direct impacts. So this is the morbidity and the mortality we see arising from things like heat waves. You know, the indirect effects refer to things like the altered distribution of disease vectors such as mosquitoes that we will see increasingly as our temperatures and rainfall patterns change. Obviously, in turn, this will lead to altered distribution of infectious diseases such as dengue. Um, you know, dengue is one that predictions suggest will become much more widespread and problematic due to climate change. The other thing is that climate change also destabilises the ecological and social systems that provide core human needs. You know, climate change has already been linked to conflict and social unrest and displacement. Um, these in turn impact health. Um, mental health is another good example of a deferred or a diffuse risk. You know, this is the depression that we see in farming communities um, affected by drought. Um, and interestingly, I, I think for, for all of us, there has been increasing recognition, particularly over the last decade, that in fact, climate change will not just broadly affect public health, um, but it already is and will increasingly have impacts on, on just about every organ system. And that very much um, in, includes the kidney. 
you know, three, three key changes that come with climate change include increased temperatures, um, altered rainfall patterns, and then increased extreme weather events. And each of these, in turn, has flow-on effects on, on various kidney diseases um, and or potential impacts on, on kidney care delivery. Um, there's now been a fair bit written on the interrelations between climate change and kidney health and disease. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this in any detail now. You know, there are a number of good review papers out there for people who are interested and would like more information. I think suffice to say the nephrology community will be confronted by a higher burden of a range of kidney diseases in the future. Um, particularly, we'll see more acute kidney injury from heat and also from infectious diseases. Um, we will see more likely more chronic kidney disease. This entity of potential heat stress nephropathy is one that is, is gaining a lot of international attention. You know, the, the underlying cause is still somewhat controversial, but it's very likely that heat is a major contributor to the, to the patterns of disease that have been seen. Um, we'll also see more stone disease um, as a result of heat. And, and, and very clearly, I think we will see disruptions to standard care delivery as things like water shortages increase um, and, and we see more extreme weather events. Um, so, but instead of talking about, about those diseases and the relationships, instead I'm going to focus for the rest of my talk on what we can do to address the underlying problem. So, so what part can we play as a community in reducing the magnitude and therefore the impacts of climate change? And the reason for this is that though we very much need our governments to act, um, we also need change within all sectors and at all levels of society. Um, you know, if, I think it is at times very tempting to look away or to think of it as someone else's problem um, or, as this cartoon suggests, to just put on some music and pretend it's not there. But I think we really do all need to be part of the solution. Um, you know, I think the other point to make is that we as a medical community and particularly as a nephrology community have a responsibility to act, you know, potentially more than other sectors. Now, this is in part because as health professionals, it's our responsibility to do all we can to protect health. It's also somewhat ironically because we are part of the problem. Um, you know, what we know is that um, if, if healthcare, global healthcare were a country, it would be the world's fifth largest greenhouse gas, em gas emitter. Um, you know, and among medical therapies, hemodialysis is a particularly big offender. You know, hemodialysis is very water hungry, it's incredibly power hungry, and it produces really quite vast amounts of waste. Um, what data from the United Kingdom tells us is that the carbon emissions impact of, of thrice weekly in centre hemodialysis is more than seven times that of the average patient in UK healthcare. And in fact, some have suggested that hemodialysis may have the highest carbon emissions and resource consumption profile of all medical therapies on a recurrent per, per capita basis. Um, peritoneal dialysis obviously uses less water and power than hemodialysis, um, but it does require the regular transport of, of packaged fluid, plastic packaged fluid, across and between countries from the point of manufacture to the point of care. And therefore, while it's, it's environmental and specifically its carbon impact has been poorly studied, um, you know, this is likely to also be large. So back to the question of what we can do. Uh, in, in my view, really the key steps are that firstly, we need to increase awareness of the problem and the solutions. We also need to improve our environmental data collection. Um, we need to start building better units. Uh, we need to undertake solutions focused research and development and we also need to advocate for broader change. And so, um, sorry. Um, the first point is increasing awareness of, of both the problems and solutions. Um, increasingly, in, in Australia at least, but I know also in, in, in numerous other parts of the world, medical schools are embedding planetary health and environmental sustainability theory into the curriculum. Um, to my knowledge though, there is no similar teaching in postgraduate medical education um, anywhere. anywhere. Um, structured incorporation of this into nephrology training programs is absolutely within our control and it's also incredibly important because if we had this in our training programs, not only would it encourage our trainees to develop the mindset to consider these environment health links, um, but also the sustainability impact of their everyday practice. And even more importantly, it would ensure they have the knowledge and the skills needed for them to enact change. Um, there is a key role for nephrology societies to play. You know, the kind of actions that would build awareness include things like prioritising topic papers in society journals, 
um, environmentally themed educations and society meetings, I suppose like this one, um, designing new educational tools and programs, and also really importantly, identifying and supporting champions within the society or within the nephrology, local nephrology community to spearhead the movement and change. Um, in Australia, a first step we took a number of years ago was to form a working group to drive these sorts of initiatives and efforts. And since that time, we really have made a fair amount of progress, particularly in the sphere of raising awareness among the rest of our community. Um, other societies are also making really important inroads. You know, the ERA, EDTA particularly is one that comes to mind. Um, but we've also quite recently seen position statements and actions coming out of Italy and, and Brazil and also Japan. And I think these are really, really great preliminary steps. Um, but there's much further for, for all societies to go and really additional societies um, to join and, and collaborate. Another thing that I think is really important is to improve environmental data collection. So in Australia recently, we conducted a survey of, of all dialysis units in our country and found that only 15% had ever performed any sort of environmental survey or audit. You know, most had no idea of the amount of water or energy they used or the amount of waste they generated. And obviously this matters because without understanding our usage or, or our impact, we can't improve on it. Uh, you know, in, in, there really is, I think, a clear need for the regular collection and reporting of resource usage data by dialysis services. And to demonstrate the power of this, back in 2005, NephroCare, which is the European network of dialysis units belonging to Fresenius Medical Care, began documenting electricity and water consumption and, and care-related waste production from each of its dialysis centres in France. What this in turn did was allow for the development of key performance indicators and environmental improvement targets, as well as the formation of action plans to enable these to be met. Um, and what happened in the subsequent years was a range of changes in dialysis units as the action plans were implemented. So dialysis machines and RO systems were upgraded to more water and power efficient versions, um, energy efficient lighting and, and motion sensors were installed and staff were educated in, in things like optimum waste management. Um, and the end result was that over a 13 year period ending in 2018, um, water and waste consumption and, sorry, power and water consumption and waste production across these units declined by really substantial amounts. And, and I think um, even better, at the same time, the yearly number of dialysis sessions more than doubled, you know, which really just makes these figures even more impressive. Financial data wasn't reported in this study, but I think it's reasonable to assume that these improvements um, would also have saved a lot of money. Uh, another important step um, relates to building better units. So the situation in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same where you are, is that new dialysis units are being built all the time as the number of people with kidney failure continues to grow. Here, there are some regulations in place around the environmental performance of new builds, but these are not specific to dialysis units. And certainly it's fair to say that environmentally sustainable design is, is not the first or even a central priority in the building of dialysis units. To try and address this, our national society, the, the ANZSN, recently partnered with an environmentally sustainable design company called Hip B Hype to develop a really robust set of, of best practice guidelines for environmentally sustainable design in, the, in kidney care facilities, specifically hemodialysis facilities. And the purpose of the guidelines is really to provide a very tailored resource for the kidney care sector so that we can integrate best practice sustainability considerations um, into the design and construction of our units and also their operation. Um, what these guidelines address is things like energy, water, waste, and then also water sustainability. And they look at general opportunities and then dialysis specific opportunities. So for instance, in the energy section, they look at lighting and heating and cooling, but then also things specific to, to um, the RO units, like centralised shutdown of equipment and, and key appliances. For water, it looks at things like water efficient appliances and, and standards, but also things like RO water recycling, which are obviously um, specific to dialysis. You know, we think that if these guidelines are well implemented, they really will help to drive best practice sustainability. And at the same time, it's highly likely they will reduce operating costs and also improve the patient care experience. And the reason for the latter is because they also look at things like biophilic design, which is a way of increasing the connection of people in buildings with a natural environment. So looking at things like natural lighting and ventilation, um, natural um, landscapes and space conditions. 
And then I think perhaps most important of all, we need solutions focused research. I mean, I suppose my view is that there really has been incredibly little progress over the last two decades with regard to dialysis technology. You know, there has been some improvement in the efficiency of, of dialysis machines and reverse osmosis systems, but these, you know, as I mentioned before, remain incredibly power and water hungry. Um, consumable usage for both hemo and peritoneal dialysis remains incredibly high. Um, most items are designed for single use here without any ability to be recycled or to be repurposed or biodegraded at the end of life. Um, because of this, there is a critical need for collaboration between us in the nephrology community, um, industry groups, and really importantly, I think other disciplines um, with the aim of finding solutions. Um, again, I think this is a really key point where nephrology societies can feed in because they can help build these sort of collaborations. Um, they can also help ensure that environmental improvement is firmly on the research agenda and help allocate funding um, accordingly. There are some exciting opportunities that are starting to surface. Um, my view coming from Australia is that a very major need in dialysis relates to water usage. You know, Australia is the driest inhabited continent on the earth and we've recently emerged from a really crippling drought that affected much of our country and there were some rural and remote towns where it was getting to the point of not enough water to drink, let alone support dialysis. Um, this is not just an Australian problem though. The WHO tells us that by 2025, so in just a few years, there will be half the world's population living in water stressed areas. Um, and by 2050, it's expected that over 5 billion people will have inadequate access to water at least one month of the year. And I think what this really tells us is there will come a time when water guzzling hemodialysis is simply not a viable treatment option. Um, a few years ago, a plenary session was given at the American Society of Nephrology by an inventor, Dean Kamen, who described his slingshot, slingshot device, which can be seen in this slide. This is a system with the ability to purify large quantities of water using vapor compression technology with very little water wastage, which obviously contrasts with reverse osmosis, which wastes huge amounts. This system also uses minimal power and it doesn't require the range of consumables that, that reverse osmosis does. So you don't need the membranes and you also don't need you know, the charcoal and any other things like that. My understanding is that this device is currently being used in some rural communities in, in India to, to provide safe drinking water. Um, and it's all also being tested in the United States in conjunction with a home hemodialysis device. To my knowledge, though, there's no movement as yet to see if it might meet the water needs of conventional hemodialysis. And I think this really is something that we should all be thinking about it and pushing for. Another new technology that I heard of quite recently was one called, or is one called forward, on, forward osmosis. Um, like reverse osmosis, this uses a semi-permeable membrane to separate water from contaminants. Unlike reverse osmosis, though, which uses hydraulic pressure to force water across the membrane, wasting a lot in the process. What this does is it uses osmotic pressure to naturally draw water across the membrane. Um, the, the pressure is created by placing a, a draw solution, so a high concentration solution on one side of the membrane. And when a liquid containing contaminants, like for instance, the, the feed solution or, or the mains water for hemodialysis is introduced on the other side of the membrane, clean water is drawn from the feed solution across the membrane to the other side, leaving the contaminants behind. The draw solution becomes diluted and the, and the feed solution becomes concentrated. And then if you imagine that that um, draw solution is concentrated dialysis, dialysate, you, you then end up with the dialysate volumes you need for hemodialysis. The other, I think, really exciting thing about this technology is that it can not only be used to purify source water to create dialysate, it can also be used to draw water for reuse out of the dialysate eff dialysis effluent. So this is shown in the figure on this slide, the, the coloured version on the side of the picture. Um, and, and basically what it shows is that when, when you run spent dialysate alongside the concentrated dialysate, you can pull the water out of the effluent and send it back through the dialyzer again. Um, one of the keys to success with board osmosis is the filtration membrane, which needs to be exceptionally efficient. And what this membrane uses is aquaporin protein. Um, so these facilitate really rapid and highly selective water transport across the membrane. Um, but they only allow water molecules to pass with all other compounds rejected. My understanding is there's a range of improvements still needed, for instance, in the area of membrane cleaning. But again, I think you know, these are the kind of breakthrough technologies that we need to be watching out for and, and pushing for. Um, there's also been um, some progress in the PD space. 
Um, some of you may have heard of the LM medical device system. You know, this project actually, or this, this um, system arose not so much to address environmental concerns in dialysis, but more out of recognition that as many people require dialysis worldwide, there are three times as many that die from lack of access to it. So back in 2015, a search began for an affordable dialysis system. And, and really the requirements that were set out from the beginning were that this system had to be as, as good as conventional dialysis from a safety and efficacy viewpoint. It had to cost less than a thousand US dollars to build or manufacture and a, and a few dollars a day to run. Um, it had to run on solar power and be able to purify water from any source. And the winner was the PD, the portable PD system you can see in this slide. Um, you can see it uses solar power um, and it, it generates sterile water for PD using a highly efficient compact distiller at the point of care. And what this system does is, is use 90% of the water um, that goes into the PD bag, so, so very little wastage. And the other thing is it obviously avoids the transport of, of prepackaged fluid um, and, and therefore the overall environmental impact is likely to be much improved compared with conventional PD and certainly hemodialysis. Um, you know, my understanding is that this system is nearing the stage of clinical trials. So again, something to watch out for. Um, so I've talked largely about water in these few slides, but there are many other things that deserve focus. For instance, you know, can we make and package our dialysis consumer wood better? You know, we need materials that are less carbon intensive to manufacture, um, you know, and that don't cause harm at the end of their life. Um, and the last thing I wanted to discuss was the role of, of nephrologists and, and really all doctors as advocates. You know, what we do as individuals and particularly as a sector really matters. But simultaneously with this, we, we really do need the broad scale government led transformative change that I talked about at the beginning. And in countries like, like ours, change at the government level typically follows increased pressure from civic society. And I think as healthcare professionals, we can be really powerful advocates for change. Um, this is in part because of our social standing, but also because of the power of the message that environmental protection is a requisite for health. You know, it's impossible to have healthy people on a sick planet. This slide is just to make the point that health professionals have a long and, and proud history of taking age for action on both the social and political stage against issues that threaten human health and wellbeing. You know, it ranges from issues way back um, in the area of slavery, we've spoken out about cholera, nuclear proliferation. You know, the issue of today is, is very much climate change. And so our advocacy is critically important. Um, we have this powerful voice, we have a powerful message. And so I think you know, there is a real responsibility on us to use that platform for the benefit of health. Um, and increasingly, the, the health community is standing up and speaking out. You know, some will have seen just recently that more than 200 of our most prominent um, medical journals um, published an editorial calling out urgent action on climate change for the sake of for the sake of health. Um, this was timed to occur in the lead up to, to COP26. Um, and sorry, I'm going the wrong way, am I? Sorry. And it received really impressive media publicity, which which is obviously important. Um, more um, last year, there was also a lot of publicity around an open letter written by representatives of more than 350 health organisations from nearly 100 countries that were calling out for a green and thereby healthy economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, as individuals, we can put our weight behind these sorts of efforts. And, and, and also, I suppose, we can pressure at a more local level our institutions and our national societies to make and, and drive the kind of change that we need to see. So my last slide with conclusions, climate change is an unprecedented threat to the health of people worldwide. Um, irrespective of what we do now, we will see an increasing burden of climate related kidney diseases over the next decade. Um, we will also see climate change increasingly impacting our ability to deliver care to our patients. Um, while recognising this and preparing for these impacts, we must also recognise that we are at this critical point in history and therefore um, it does fall to us to contribute in, in all ways we can um, to avoid the unmanageable. You know, we must play our part in addressing or, or mitigating climate change, not only through addressing the impact of our own care, but also through advocating for change. Thank you and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Catherine. This is Dr. Bokulnan. It's a very excellent and a very incisive presentation.
on climate change and what nephrology nephrologists can do to contribute towards preventing this climate change. In a developing country, we are we are faced with more problems of climate change itself. Yeah. So, what's your take on that? Because we have limited resources, and the whatever you have proposed, these practical problems, and practical solutions, really good. Like the 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 slim, be very very useful. What is your take on what would be the scenario for a developing country with this climate change? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a really important point. It's it's one of the major things about climate change is it's not just an environmental or a health issue. It's also a social justice issue, and that, you know there's really disproportionate contributions to the problem and and responsibilities for acting. I think the really important thing for the nephrology sector though is that you know very environmental initiatives by and large in, involve resource conservation, and when you conserve resources, you also save money. So if you approach these sorts of therapies. Um, things like dialysis therapies in the most environmentally sustainable way, they will be more sustainable therapies from a financial point of view as well. Um, so I think, you know, particularly the things around building better units and, and pushing for the research and development, if we can get um, better units, if we can get better technologies, then it means that, you know, that there's more ability to deliver care. Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I, I suppose I feel quite um, in, embarrassed by the contribution my country is making at the moment. And I think on the sort of national level, there certainly is obviously all these international discussions around the responsibility that individual countries take. But I think whatever level and, and wherever, the really important thing to recognise is the opportunities that come with acting, not just the problems that come um, as, as a result of, of the climate impacts that are locked in. Thank you, Doctor. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Uh, Ma'am, uh, that was a nice lecture. I just want one clarification. How does a 5008 uh, dialysis machine, you know, save more water than the conventional 4008? I mean, do you use less uh, dialysate solution? What is the exact mechanism? You said it's almost 50% Sorry. reduction in water wastage, 5008 dialysis machine. Sorry, would you mind repeating that? I just missed the beginning bit of it. So you said something about how did it save water? Which which what which one were you referring to? In the slide, you mentioned that the five zero zero eight dialysis machine saves water by almost fifty percent compared to the conventional four zero zero eight. So can you just clarify how you save water with five zero zero eight? With the slingshot machine, did you say? No, no, not slingshot. The five zero zero eight dialysis hemodialysis machine. Oh, sorry, the, the, the upgraded reverse osmosis systems. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble hearing. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the very lucid and very practical to, to the point uh, what we can do for the uh, climate to be more conducive for our uh, well being and the small steps we can take to make the impact on a global level, we as personal and as a nephrology community where we can uh, change, make a small change to the preventing the climate deteriorating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ma'am, one more question. What is your suggestion on the reuse or single use of dialyzer, which is more environment friendly? Which is more environmentally friendly out of single use and reusing? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the thing with that is to, to you know, in, in many cases, we don't know. So what we do is we make these consumables and we use them, but we don't do the life cycle analysis to actually understand their environmental impact. Um, and I think it really depends in where you live, what your energy mix is from, where the, the components that make up those products are brought in for. And so I think really what's needed there is much more environmental impact assessment and life cycle analysis of the products that we use. So you know, at the moment when we negotiate contracts, et cetera, we want to know how much the items cost and whether they do the job that they do. We don't really ask what the carbon emissions impact of that product is, and it's not provided by industry. I think half the time it's not known. Um, and so you know, I think, if you, for instance, have a, an energy system that is very high, has a very high penetration of renewables, and you can do things like autoclave equipment or, or sterilise equipment in a way that 
um, doesn't use a lot of fossil fuel derived energy, then you may have a, a low impact of, of reusing equipment. Um, so it really, it really depends. I guess my, my key point is we need more research and more monitoring so that we can really understand the impact of, of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, and thank you, sirs. With that, we move on to the next topic.